Can't wait for him to rank the seals. Please rank all the shields. I need to know. Ranking all katanas? Ooh. Ranking every particle effect. Elven Ring ranked types of grass gets closer and closer. And for my next video, I shall rank the crafting materials. Rusty, have you ranked the skyboxes yet? Rusty doesn't yet? eventually rank all the weapons Still we're riding in the streets. And I wonder if he's ranking. the churches. Yeah, but did you rank pots rank the already? Just bite the bullet. Rank all the eventually he ashes. has to ranking get to that top five. five gave him a whole I'm ranking all the aromatic Rank all the quest lines. Rank, rank all the best. Rank all, rank all the best. Rank all the best. Okay, cool. Rank all the room pay. I, well... Thanks for your suggestions, I guess? Is this all I am to you anymore? Jesus, remember back in the good old days when you could make actual content? Don't y'all want to see, like, some, I don't know, some cat videos or something? No? All right, fine. You guys can watch this instead. NordVPN, what are you doing here? <laughs> God, this transition sucks. NordVPN can keep all of your data, personal information, and even search history hidden from ISPs that pretend they're interested in keeping all your stuff private, but really aren't. But a VPN also gives you more than that. You'd be surprised how rife public spaces are with criminals looking to make a quick buck or three off of your negligence, and that's even more dangerous when you can go hours or even days at a time without knowing you've been hit. In today's world, privacy has felt less like a right and more like a privilege, and it's one of those things that a lot of ISPs and businesses tend to only consider a crime if you're actually caught. It also comes with its own threat protection that identifies malware and trackers on your system. You may be internet savvy enough to know a Discord Nitro scam when you see one, but scammers know to target the weakest links. A single NordVPN account can host up to six people, so you can bring the rest of your family onto your plan without needing to pay for any more than just a single plan. I said the word plan twice there. You know what? I'm gonna I'm just gonna leave it in. Who cares? If you sign up for an exclusive two-year deal using my link in the description, you get four free months of service on top of that, and there's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have plenty of time to reconsider if you're having second thoughts. Number 36, the Reminiscence Paintings. I already ranked these, but people technically count these as quests for some reason. I don't know what constitutes a quest, but I feel like it should be more than an X marks the spot minigame. W what is this, Resident Evil? Do I get to harpoon a fish and sell it to Kale for a secret incantation no one knew about? The rewards are far from outstanding. You get a larval tier, which has a nice function, but isn't exactly rare once you hit Nocron and realize people are picking larval tiers out of their Cheerios every morning. A bug, a summon, a harp, a hood, a decent Ash of War that makes bows worth using kinda. And the great privilege of being able to set yourself on fire, which gives you the opportunity to make your own emotionally themed paintings. Number 35, Raya, and or Zorias. I think right about now is when I should be clarifying that this ranking has little to do with the quality of the NPCs themselves, but rather how natural the progression feels, how impactful the quest is to other events in their proximity, and just how good the rewards are. Rest assured, if this were strictly an NPC ranking, Celavus would be chilling right here and dead last just like he deserves. Boo! You stink! It's not like Raya is all that memorable either, right? Yeah, you guys remember Raya? The hunch back of Volcano Manor? This is way too much legwork to just watch some chick turn into a lizard. But Datacar's woe is the kind of talisman there's just barely enough support for for me to be afraid of saying anything bad about it. Wait a minute, no I'm not. Shit's trash. Leave it alone. Number 34, Preceptor Celibus. I honestly don't think this guy has a single supporter in this entire community. It's genuinely impressive how unanimously disrespected this dude is. This game's community really does come together on some of the oddest subjects. We can't talk about something as simple as a weapons tier list without someone getting verbally disemboweled for expressing a fondness of whatever greatsword people don't like this week. But there are fewer senses of unity stronger and more ironclad than a 20 million player sized middle finger to what might be the most morally unpleasant, rejectable NPC Miyazaki has ever non-consensually placed in our laps. Go fuck a puppet, puppet fucker. And take your stupid rewards with you. Number 33, Sorcerer Roger. This dude really deserved so much better. Look at this drip. Man probably could have courted Cleopatra if he wanted, but he spends his last days as a tier 3 sub sinking into a sofa while his E-Princess hugs everyone except him in the next room over. There isn't a single reward given by this questline that you can't just naturally obtain by talking to Roger at Stormvale, sending him to the round table, and just waiting for him to bite the dust. If I can just keep playing the game for two hours and then stop by later to loot his plus 8 sword off his corpse, 
rooms. That's not a quest reward. That's a drop. Get the knife print and return to Roger, and he then tells you to find Ronnie. Why do I need to return to the round table and tell him Ronnie rejected all my advances? Is this how you boost your confidence or something? Your life savings is being held captive over Fia's feet picks. I don't have to listen to a single word you say. Number 32, Hiata. Hiata's questline looks very inconspicuous at a glance. All you really do is feed a woman weird yellow grapes for five interactions, and then whoops, just unlock the bad ending. Whoops, Melina just ghosted me and I'm pretty sure she wants me dead. Whoops, bitch is on fire. Sorry, here, have another grape. It took forever for me to actually find the appropriate locations, and when I did, I still never felt like I was doing something right. I was just giving this woman weird grapes slash eyeballs. Why is this a quest? The rewards are as follows. One gesture, a pair of cosplay contacts, and the frenzied flame seal, which, uh, okay, can, can we, can we just, can we talk about the seal for a minute? When are you ever going to need a no requirement seal this late into the game? I've seen so many people try to argue a case for this thing, and I just don't see it. Having no stat requirements has led a lot of people to say this seal is great for non-faith builds who want to cast beginner incantations, but are you really having that much trouble meeting the finger seal's head in the clouds ask of 10 faith? It can be picked up from the twin maid as soon as you get to the round table. The fucking vagabond can use this seal with one measly level. J just help me understand, please. Number 31, Gatekeeper Gostok. Gostok's quest line is just something that completes itself in the background while you're busy doing more important things. Talk to him at Stormvale, doesn't matter which option you pick, go inside this door and get ambushed by the Banished Knight, and then kill the Lord of all that's insecure, and fucking bam! You don't need to revisit this quest line again until you've put down Morgot six hours later when you forgot about his existence entirely. There are also two other entirely separate quest lines tied to this quest's completion and to Gostok opening his shop again. Not sure what kind of inventory he's peddling. Bitch looks homeless, but he does sell you an ancient dragon smithing stone for 20,000 runes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, okay, I see the arrangement now. I'm the one funding your fucking shop. Is that it? Number 30, Gowry. I can already tell we're gonna run into a lot of quests like this. Overlapping side quests are one thing, but having an NPC questline facilitated by the existence of another questline is just bag of bricks, pants on head, stupid. Wanna know the first task you're given for Gowry? Gowry's questline, go find the AIDS general somewhere in the swamp and get his needle or whatever, then find Millicent and, and, and finish, finish her questline. So you're sending me to do another NPC's quest? Sorry, can't talk to you till you're done. Number 29, Kenneth Height. I'm, I'm sorry, why is this guy important again? And why is he asking me to go sack a random knight into fourth that doesn't matter? Actually, do you even explain why this fort's so important? I don't even think he says anything notable outside of just repeatedly saying it's his fort and those are his men. Do whatever he wants and he'll give you an Erdsteel dagger. Wonderful, a weapon that doesn't get good until the mid game, which just so happens to be exactly when you find another one. I don't know about this guy. The whole air of him just reeks of crypto scams and taking shit personally. I can't bring myself to trust anyone who uses the phrase jumped up country bumpkin to describe another man, no matter how pathetic he is. Number 28, the Jar Baron. Now, hold on. I like the NPC by himself. I think he's a good character. A quest with this many prerequisites and handbrake turns, however, should not be rendered inaccessible just because I got slippery fingers and my halberd suddenly wedged itself inside the stomach of one of his brothers. Meet and save Alexander at least once, exhaust some dialogue, reload the area, exhaust some dialogue, make some headway on Dialysis' questline, reload, talk to Dialos and try to calm him down before he does anything stupid, return to Jarberg and see Dialos doing something stupid, only not that stupid because he was actually defending the jars from poachers or something. Reload, talk to the Baron, reload again, talk to the damn Baron, holy shit, stop this. Follow Alexander all the way to Fara Missoula to finish his quest, give the Baron his guts as a gift. Oh, never mind, accidentally kicked over a trash can or something and now he won't talk to me anymore. C cool, good quest. Number 27, Rodrika. Rodrika can be found inside the Stormhill Shack, lamenting over what a craven she is and how scary spiders are, or whatever the fuck. Okay, does anyone care? This quest is like 10 minutes long. It literally auto-completes itself once you journey past Stormvale. So you can just talk to her, rendezvous at the round table, and then take that weird path to the right and glide around Stormvale Castle, and you can finish up Rodrika's entire quest line in less than a minute. The Chrysalid's memento doesn't even matter. You can bypass it completely, and the game will just shrug its shoulders and be like, shit, fine, whatever, and just open up spirit tuning for you anyways. I almost wish this video had slightly different criteria, because then I could just wedge in the jellyfish quest and tell you how good that one was, but no, 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 you're getting this one instead. 
Number 26, Garenk. This egg hunt wouldn't be nearly as frustrating if it didn't take six death root to finally start getting decent rewards. Claw mark seal is bad. It's 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 just bad. Bestial sling has been tumbling down an 89 degree slope for months now, and beast roar is okay. Beast roar is actually pretty damn good. I have no idea what exactly happens here, but mouth foam over your little goodie basket for too long, and he gets baby mad like a broomstick broke off in his ass and starts attacking you for no reason. He's almost always going to be too strong for you at the level you're probably at. So if you want to continue harvesting those rewards, your best chance is to just aggro the black blade outside and hope Garank gets bitch slapped by it before you do. There's no way this is the intended method. It just can't be. But this is North Kalid scaling. I've only found four death root. I'm not even through Liernia yet. Can we show some patience? Fortunately, the second half of the quest rewards actually get pretty high quality. He ends up giving you Stone of Garank, the Beast Claw Great Hammer, and even an Ancient Smithing Stone. So if you remember to even come back here when you're strong enough to finally kick his ass, I, I guess it's kind of worth it. Number 25, D, Hunter of the Dead. Not really a lot going on with this guy. It only ever seems like D's existence is to facilitate the quest lines of other, more important NPCs. He tells you how dangerous the Tibia Mariners are, which is already a big fat doubt right out of the gate, and once you kill it and seize its death root, he just shrugs his shoulders like, fine, bitch, think you can do my job? Here's Garank, here's the sending gate, I'm gonna go get stabbed by Mrs. OnlyFans over there. Number 24, Shabriri. This quest line only begins in the mountaintops, and I'm pretty sure you could actually try to screw up Yura's quest as much as any human possibly could. You could delete Yura from the game, and Shabriri would still just show up in a checkered, textureless version of his clothes. There's no stopping the appearance of this quest line. It just doesn't happen. Shabriri standing here next to this boulder is as inevitable as daylight itself. So that means it has to be, like, important, right? Well, he essentially just tells you how awesome the frenzied ending is and how cool it would be if you went and did it, with the same energy of a cop teaching a middle schooler how to say no to drugs. And then you can just go and do it. Go and complete Hiatus quest line while you're there, I guess, and he just starts screaming his balls off when you come back to him. Number 23, D, Beholder of Death. D's twin brother, the Beholder, has a slightly more interesting quest line in that it has the opportunity to fork into different paths depending on who kills his brother, but ultimately yields no interesting rewards for either outcome. If you give him the twin set after Fia kills D, he appears as a summonable phantom for the Valiant Gargoyles fight, and then he'll be found mourning in front of Godwin's body in the deep root depths with a bloodied sword and Fia's dead corpse just laying right there. But if you kill him and then give D the Beholder, the twin set, he becomes hostile when you reload the area. It's a nice expansion of the game's backstory, but the actual tangible rewards you get are pretty boring. Number 22, the Dung Eater. The Dung Eater is a fat sack of bloated crap that constantly goes around thinking he's stronger than he is. He can very easily kill the blackguard towards the end of his quest if you're clumsy and overlap the progression of the quest lines in a weird way. So if you've been progressing the blackguard's quest line far enough to where he appears in Altus for the first time, you've pretty much sealed the fate of his untimely death. Do this quest first if it really matters that much to you to begin with, and then just forego the Volcano Manor quest line for now and go by pro from Bogart once you've advanced the Dung Eater quest line along enough. Following this quest line actively puts other people in danger, and you have to jump through a bunch of weird fucking hoops just to keep everyone safe. He's called Loathsome for a reason. His puppet is one of the best spirit summons in the game, too, in case you needed a reason to justify the Celevist quest. Number 21, Corhin. Corhin's quest involves a whole lot of talking, and Elden Ring is not a dating sim. I've already done videos on plenty of those already, apparently. Talk to him in this location, talk to him over here in this other location now, then talk to him here, talk to him over there, holy fuck, I'm gonna hate myself for typing this, because that means I'll have to start a whole new save file just for the goddamn quest. The ending it unlocks is one of the more coveted endings in the community, and I'm willing to show a bit of patience to the rest of the quest line for that reason, but Corin as an NPC is just very boring. Literally in the first dialogue sequence, he tells you he teaches the strength of the two fingers, but hand him the prayer book and ask him to teach you a spell or two, and he just looks at you like you whipped your dick out in the middle of church. It's just a pair of healing spells. How is this a heresy? Is wanting to live a fucking dissidence in this timeline? Number 20, Gideon Offnir. Accumulating knowledge? You're accumulating dust from standing in the same two goddamn spots for the whole game. Do you even have legs? You stand behind this stupid desk all day, and the only time you actually get up off your ass is to tell me you've been plotting against me all along. None of what you give me is even good. Even Divine Fortification only slaps as abusively hard as it does because of the sudden damage spike towards the end game. It almost feels necessary. But it is entertaining to exhaust his first bits of dialogue because it allows you to hear phrases you never knew you needed to, like 
Namby Pamby Tarnished. Wow, they actually put my granddad in the game. They did it. Number 19, Nefeli Lou. Nefeli's quest line is introduced by her standing over somebody that I'm sure meant something to someone at some point. This is part of a trio of somewhat linked quest lines that once you defeat Morgoth, will have them rendezvous at the center of Godric's throne and throw a you're gonna kick ass party, only instead of confetti, they just stand in an awkward formation and compliment you for two minutes and then leave. Nefeli's quest is slightly more eventful than the other two. One tries to kill you like five times without your technical knowing, and the other gives the impression of a fake old CEO of a company that hasn't been around for 15 years and doesn't want to admit he can barely afford rent. Nefeli, on the other hand, gives me an arsenal charm. So, small benefit, I guess. Number 18, Fia. This quest would actually be kind of enjoyable to follow if it didn't require you to contract an STD just to further the dialogue. Shit happens like five times, and I'm never completely sure if what I've done advances the dialogue, so sometimes you'll just get hugged and she doesn't even say anything different and you're just left with her little shitty parting gift. Continuing the quest, however, opens you up to experiencing probably one of the coolest dragon bosses in the game. Meet up with her in the Nameless City, give her the curse mark, watch her advertise her OnlyFans for a couple minutes, and then enter the dream. I really like the dragon fight, but I don't like how I have to slap my way through her simp army to get to it. I like the cool new area, but I don't like how easy it is to miss. Otherwise, I don't know. There's lots of highs and lows with this quest, so I think it's most appropriate to just put it somewhere in the middle. The exact middle, to be precise. Number 17, Patches. Lots of trivial, meaningless rewards to be gathered here, but there are two exceptions, being the Magma Whip Candlestick Patches gives you after killing Tragoth, and Tragoth dropping the Bull Goat set, which, if you're going solely by the numbers, is probably the single greatest heavy armor set in the game. It's also home to one of the most underwhelming gotcha moments of all time, since his chest trap sends you into the woods of Limgrave, but if you've been inside the Murkwater Cave at all, then you can just, you know, teleport back. So what's the point? It's still worth seeing his quest through to Liernia because he divulges some info about the awkwardly placed Turbo Virgin inside Rhea Lucaria that kidnaps you and takes you straight to Volcano Manor, where Patches ends up anyways. Get on Tannis' good side and complete one of her requests, then find him somewhere in the manor and he'll tell you to go and take a big old poop on Tregoth near the ruin-strewn precipice before where you fought Makar. He continues his reputation of trying to look like he's inconveniencing you but secretly helping you along the way, pushing you right to where you need to go. He even sells you Margit Shackle, which works twice on Margit's fight in Limgrave and once on Morgod and Landell. He's surprisingly very helpful, even if the leather set and that plus seven spear does start looking pretty shiny when he kicks you down that fucking cliff. Number 16, Irina and Edgar. Her quest line doesn't give you a lot equipment-wise, but the true load comes from the heavy emotional weight you must carry when facing the cruelty of the world you've trapped yourself in. Delivering Irina's letter to Edgar gets you this monologue about how he's really bad at paying child support or something, and he needs to go stay with his weird derelict castle for a few minutes before coming to his senses. So go kill his boogeyman down near the lake, get a legendary armament, and head back to Edgar to give him the all good. He'll feel the weight lifted and returns to Irina only to find her dead on the ground with a meat cleaver buried into her spine. He invades you inside the Revenger shack in Liernia and drops one of those Shabriri grapes. This is one of those few cases where I actually feel like putting him down when he's still in the castle and looting his halberd might be the morally superior option. Number 15, Insha. Insha's quest is the kind of quest line that other quest lines should aspire to be like. If you're going to drag my ass all the way across numerous biomes and landmarks, lecturing me over the symbolism of some dude who tied a golden dinner plate around his face and now people just like him for some reason, at least have the courtesy of making it worth my while. I have no goddamn idea who Insha is, and I go to sleep every night without giving a shit. All I know is it takes exactly two steps to complete the quest line. Talk to him and get one of the greatest gestures in the game, then take a trip over to Albus Dumble Dick or whatever his name is and receive the half medallion, then head back to the round table and kick his edgy ass back to whatever season of JoJo's he fucking came from. You get an armor set with a really useful passive, a cool gesture, and the clinging bone, which is the proud owner of one of the most underrated weapon skills in the game. Be more like Insha. Be like Insha and stay the fuck quiet unless spoken to. Number 14, White Mask Vare. Go heat yourself up some rice and vice grip that Y button, because we've got another talker. Exhaust Vare's dialogue the first time you see him. Go to the round table and exhaust the dialogue of everyone, every single person there. Then return to Vare and listen to his weird trauma dump or whatever. Defeat Godric, head back to Vare for a chat, talk with him again at the Roast Church in Liernia. Then he'll give you five bloody fingers with which you- Oh, fuck. I have, to, I have to go online. I have to invade people. Well, see you, cheat engine. Once you've invaded three people, soak the Lord of Blood's favor in the blood of a deceased finger maiden at either the Church of Inhibition or the Chapel of Anticipation.
Now it's time to collect one of the greatest rewards in the whole game. An inexhaustible shortcut straight to Mogwin Palace and a big mountain-sized middle finger to those c**ts in the snowfields. The importance of opening up the palace this early is that it has the second highest enemy scaling in the entire game, surpassed only by Elphile. So killing any single mob here can get you like two whole levels. A pretty incredible reward, even if it does break your progression for the rest of the game. Number 13, Bach. Yeah, yeah, I know, the quest items are shit, and the only notable thing it unlocks is one of the most pointless features in the game that so brazenly shows off what little time everyone spent on the backs of all the caped armors, but I don't have the cruelty in me to rank his quest based solely on that. None of the graces in which you run into him are really all that out of the way, which was perhaps a deliberate choice. Even Melina approaches you at one point, just pleading with you like someone's little sister trying to adopt a disabled dog to just like, I don't know, be nice to him for fun fuck's sake, purchase some new demigod drip from Enya, and then give him the gold sewing needle you get from the Chapel of Anticipation, at which point he will then be asked to be rebirthed by Renala, and then the quest just pulls the greatest handbrake left turn out of its ass. Watch this. You're beautiful. Did I just hear my mum speaking? Are you hearing this shit? I can't stress enough what a rare occurrence it is to actually be able to choose how you respond to people in this game's dialogue sequence. I could have used this for such a greater purpose. I could have went for the frenzied ending and told Melina, wait, it's okay, I'm going to travel through the shitty bowels of time itself to kill a dragon lord and vanquish the frenzy inside me so lords in the future don't have to deal with their regret, but instead it's given to a random side quest involving a physically insecure demi-human who misses his mom and just wants to make armor worse. I, you know what? I'm getting pissed. I'm moving on before I change my fucking mind. Number 12, Sorceress Selen. Selen's quest line opens up some of the hardest hitting bacon and eggs grand slam sorceries you'll ever need, including Shard Spiral, Glintstone Comet Shard, and star Stars of... Stars of Ruin, which isn't that great, but you'll still get Star Shower either way, so who cares. Find Comet Azur near the Demi-Human Queen boss behind Mount Gelmir, and then tell her you found her master. She'll then give you the Celian Seal Breaker that dispels the barrier blocking access to the Celia Hideaway in Kaled. Finding both masters opens up new dialogue at her location in the Witchbane Ruins when she tells you she's been uh, using a projector screen or something to appear in the Waypoint Ruins. I don't know. Weird fucking sorcery magic or something. I don't know. You came to the wrong place for that explanation. All I know is I want that sorcery to. Get her ass out of Witch Bane Ruins before you defeat Radon. Otherwise, Jaren will find her and kill her and end the rest of her questline. Extract her primal glintstone and then find her puppet duplicate near Ronnie's Rise and revive her there. Go and kill Radon. Then go to the basement of Witch Bane's Ruins to cue some dialogue with Jaren. Jesus shit, this footage is gonna be a nightmare. Once Renala is defeated, two summon signs will appear near the Grand Library Grace where you can choose to either help or challenge Selen. Help her and regain access to her shop, now with Shard Spiral the Witch Hunter drop, and the Glintstone Chris. And the reason I'm being so stringent on outlining the entire quest here is because I've been mispronouncing Azure for over a year now, and not a single comment has ever corrected me on it. So I get the feeling most of you freaks just wrote a note near Waypoint Ruins like Foot Goddess or something, and then immediately forgot she existed. Go do the quest. It, it's cool, I promise. Number 11, Ronnie. I don't think I need to walk people through this one. It's one of the most popular side quests that opens up probably the single most coveted ending in the game's community. You don't go hollow and get eternally haunted by your ex-wife, no one gets a free and mandatory shit mark from the Dung Eater, and everything in the game still gets rested from the controlling, intolerant grasp of the greater will. It's also a surprisingly flexible quest that allows you to miss some earlier appearances and still end up finding her in key locations. Ronnie's quest will be your sole reason for heading down into the Eternal cities, through the Lake of Rot, and subsequently through Estelle's fuck-ugly face, and finally to the Moonlight Altar. These locations are practically synonymous with Ronnie's quest, only because you have little reason to visit these locations otherwise. If the Magic Scorpion Charm really means that much to you, continue Celibus's quest line up to when he gives you the amulet, and then give Ronnie the Finger Slayer Blade to turn him into a puppet. Good. Oh, and I guess the Dark Moon Greatsword's pretty cool. Number 10, Bloody Finger Hunter Yura. Yura has some pretty amusing dialogue that isn't exactly hidden, but kind of hard to find if you don't know to look for it. During his first interaction, he'll warn you about a dragon hanging out near the lake, go and die to it, and then return to Yura, and he'll lecture you about what a massive throbbing dumbass you are for picking a fight with a dragon. Further his quest line by helping him execute Bloody Finger Phantoms, starting with Nereus near the river leading to Murkwater Cave, the Ravenmount Assassin, and then finally Eleonora. This quest offers two of the sweetest arcane weapons available. 
available, the Reduvia and Eleonora's Pole Blade, in addition to giving you the Raptor of the Mist Sash. It's a pretty streamlined quest with very little deviation, but the abrupt ending where you just show up in the mountaintops and find out his body is now being puppeted by this shablabla ass face is a bit of a mood killer. No matter where you are in his quest, showing up to the mountaintops will lock you out of whatever you haven't finished. So does Eleonora even defeat him in this case? Who, like, who kills him? Maybe a stray goat busted his kneecap on the way to the second church and he just decided that's where he was gonna clock out. Fuck, I don't know, write your own ending. Number 9, Tanith. Never has there been a more straightforward questline. She doesn't budge an inch during any of the missions she gives you. She isn't gone shopping for milk when you're halfway through the manor letters or something. She always has a good word for you when you're done, and going against the Ur Tree and the Greater Will is the morally correct decision, making this one of my favorite questlines available in the game. The rewards themselves, on the other hand, are almost entirely worth passing over, save for two standouts, being the Petal Whip and the Magma Shot. I would almost wish that every quest in Elden Ring were this linear, but that's also risking most of your story-driven elements becoming really boring to follow. I get why it's necessary, I'm just bitching. That's what I'm known for. Number 8, Blythe. Blythe has a very flexible quest line, and I think most of that is due to just how many steps there are in actually completing it. I think someone may have went back and tested its progression, and once he started growing a beard and missing his family, an executive decision was made to allow the player to maybe skip a few steps on the way. This is why Radon's defeat ended up being established as a fast-forward button for a few different quests, at least, I think. The second half of the quest involves freeing Blythe from the forlorn Hound Everjail where you killed Darawil, and I don't think how you do the first part of the quest really really impacts whether or not he's imprisoned, because searching Blythe D returns a higher result for dating sim than it does the actual name of the goddamn boss, so I'm just going to assume it doesn't matter. Number 7, Latena. In addition to just outright handing you what may well be one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, ranged summon in the game, it's also a quest that I have a great deal of respect for, simply because it's just easy to follow. You see that tree? You see those fields of consecrated snow beneath it? Want to guess what that area is called? Well, after digging up the two halves of the secret medallion, we can find out for ourselves. Latina has a line of dialogue that vaguely suggests the location of the second medallion half, but there's a chance you'll have no idea what she's even talking about, because the castle she's referring to doesn't appear on the map until you've made it to the mountaintops. Latina even lets you know you're getting close, because a unique line of dialogue plays once you've entered the snowfields. From there, the path is surprisingly unobstructed, save a couple staged invasions. Summoning her at the altar of the apostate derelict gives you you an ancient somber stone, and you even get to keep the summon. Number 6, Bernal. Bernal's quest line gives you some mixed rewards regardless of how far you see his quest through, but defeating Rikard and then exhausting his dialogue means he does become summonable for the Godskin duo fight, even if he does bring a fire weapon with him, which is uh, a bit, a bit dull probably a uh, lack of foresight, if I'm being honest. This also involves one of my favorite plot twist moments that can only be fully enjoyed if you first meet Bernal at the War Master shack in Limgrave, talking up what a massive supporter of the Erd Tree he is, and now suddenly finding him in the manor swearing on his life that he'll sever Radagon's balls with a cafeteria spork leaves a much weightier impact. You have the opportunity to fight alongside Bernal two different times, firstly when invading Vargrim and Wilhelm, and secondly when fighting the Godskin duo, which decently builds up the conclusion of you two finally facing off in Fara Missoula. The Devourer Scepter isn't the greatest drop, but the Beast Champion set gives you some context as to why Bernal suddenly went off the deep end when his maiden gave herself to the Frenzied Flame. Or she she may have just taken a cannonball dive into some dude's campfire. Not really sure what's being insinuated here, I, I just know that fire is involved. Number 5, Bogart. Bogart is a ray of hope in an otherwise dejected and emotionally resigned world, where people sort of just accept that being on the receiving end of someone else's currently shitting ass is just another Tuesday. Bogart initially reads you as a punk, and whether or not he's actually correct is determined by your response to him telling you to fuck off. Buy Raya's necklace from him and it'll open the shop. Buying prawns from him, befriends him, and furthers his questline. From here, it's very easy to accidentally kill him if you push the Dung Eater's quest far enough to where he appears outside the outer moat in Landell. Going to Volcano Manor locks you out of Bogart's quest entirely, but you can forego this area and finish Dung Eater's quest first before making any headway on Bogart's questline. Or just don't do the Dung Eater quest. That, that's a novel idea. That might be a tall order for some, but Bogart is number 5 for a reason. Endless physical damage negation items is worth trading 10 Dung Eater endings for in my book, and if that remark ends up offending some 22-year-old man in the town of Fucknuts, Kentucky with a six-digit amount of Reddit karma and a shrine devoted to Millicent's thighs, then I will happily accept that as part of my job description. 
Number four, Millicent. This quest line is sort of controversial for a few different reasons. Firstly, its length. Millicent's quest line begins as you complete the first step in Gowry's quest for the Golden Needle and use it to quell the Scarlet Rod inside Millicent's body. Subsequently, she appears at the Church of the Plague, Gowry's Shack, Urtree Gazing Hill, at which point you give her the Valkyrie's prosthesis from inside the Shaded Castle, Windmill Heights, Ancient Snow Valley, the Prayer Room just inside Elphile, and finally near the Drainage Channel Grace where the Herpes Lake is. That's a lot to digest, but it is one of two popular quests that guide you toward the optional areas of the end game and basically showing you where those areas are. Secondly, the Putrid Spirit. Fuck you. Third and finally, the rewards for invading Millicent at the final stage of her questline has a reward that's arguably just as coveted as the others, which is the Millicent's prosthesis talisman. This has branched into a very multifaceted debate where invading Millicent may be the less satisfying ending to her story, but the talisman might be worth it to a lot of players. Helping Millicent gets you the unalloyed golden needle, which in turn allows you access to Mikola's needle after defeating Melania, which is a key item for reversing the effects of the frenzy flame when used at the arena arena of Dragonlord Placidisax. Don't worry, all of this is in the item descriptions. You don't need to read a wiki to remember this shit, I promise. Number three, Thops. Thops is everything that a brilliant side quest should have, in my opinion. It's short enough to be confined in a single area while also giving you enough lore and additional context that properly explains the sideways fucked ethics of said area. You just talk to him in the Church of Aerith, find the second Glintstone key near the rafters in the area just beside where you find the Azure Staff, give him the key, send him to his death, and then Fortnite-style shake his corpse loose for some of the most underrated quest rewards in the game. You receive the sorcery Thops is buried which is an outright middle finger to the very notion of bullet spam that's great against sorcerers and, uh, bosses of the final variety. And the Academy Glintstone Staff, which is consistently found on the top three most powerful sorcery catalysts, regardless of intelligence level, and only starts getting nudged out of the way by objectively more powerful options like the two Grandmaster Staffs and the Regal Scepter towards the endgame. Number two, Dialos. Dialos is another case of how one can experience a great tragedy of some sort and then ultimately decide the fight for the Ur Tree just isn't worth it. But instead of talking about how he wants to sip wine using the Elden Beast's arteries as a, a curly straw or something, he laments how easily he was taken advantage of and swept into the clutches of the recusants, which I think makes him a tad more relatable as a character. From here, either finish the Tanith questline or defeat Rikard, and he'll move to Jarberg where the Jar Baron is. If he isn't there, make sure you've saved Al Alexander at least once and exhausted the Jar Baron's dialogue. Once Radon is defeated, Jarberg will have finally been seized by the poachers the Jar Baron was warning of. Dialos tries to fend them off and does so successfully. Uh, kinda, but then succumbs to his wounds, allowing the Jar Baron NPC some of the greatest dialogue lines I think I've heard in any quest. He's a top-shelf character that experiences a redemption arc after being thoroughly gaslit by Tanith and the Recusants, and it's the only way in the whole game to obtain two separate pedal whips without the need to roll over to New Game Plus. Number one, Iron Fist Alexander. Jesus shit, this was not... This was not supposed to be a long video. Wonderful payoff, cool NPC fight, very exploration friendly since he appears in main areas, and his quest is just flexible enough to allow for a skip or two in the earlier sections. Shard of Alexander might be the single greatest talisman in the game. Kill him too early and the game itself punishes you with a significantly weaker talisman as your reward. As though Miyazaki himself is calling you out and telling you to dine on some scrotum salad for being so impatient and treating everything like a loot bag you can just bust open with a big stick, you buffoon. Learn to nurture some care for your goddamn brothers in arms, you piss-drenched vagrant. He literally falls on the ground in pieces at one point, and he's still talking shit, telling you how strong he's gonna get. And then he just goes and does it. He gets shit for being weak and a pushover because of his performance in the Radon fight, but he is a porcelain tank against a fire giant, and he's one of the very few NPCs that actually make it all the way to the penultimate area of the game. Blythe couldn't make it, Dialos couldn't make it, he's stronger than most, he treats you with respect, and his last words could have made it into the draft of a Braveheart script. All vessels are destined to one day break, but the great Alexander lived as a warrior to his last. 